you understand where our concerns are. We have allowed building on the coastal wave dynamic zone, which is not healing itself. So you're, you're causing impediments there. So with that is one, then we're, we have no more sand dunes, as you were talking about, that was the mean feed for all of it. So it's not an infinite supply any longer. So all we're trying to say, if we can make sure that you can produce that document to say, you know what, you, you just said it, it can, you hate the word, or you're not comfortable <laughs> yeah. with it, being a coastal engineer, a conveyor coming down yeah. from the north to the south. If we can get something that is steadfast, because the report in the EIA showed the plume of, of fines in the sediment delivery, showing where it would be resuspended and so forth, and it talked about these lethal zone and non-lethal zone and, and so forth. The study talked about clarity of water. That was a lot of what we were concerned with. Would Seven Mile Beach lose the clarity of water? They did not talk about the sand, the sand delivery transportation. And I'm glad that you highlighted that as well. Not specifically, like you said, it's very limited in scope. And you know, we need that just like how you're going to be doing everything else. You, by you putting, saying, well, what are you right? You have a lot more upland development that is impacting your Seven Mile Beach. We took out the dunes. We're building in wave impact zones. All of those things, you hit the nail on the head. Imagine, Scott, if we then do the trifecta and do something within the coastal area that may impact it forever um, and that we, it's irrevitable and we lose that Seven Mile Beach because of all of non-thinking and, spe and specified planning of coastal engineers that would have then come back and go, well, hmm, what did you do wrong? Or how yeah. can we mitigate this in going further? How can we save it? And that's the biggest concern because we got a $100 billion worth of real estate right over there. We sell $300 million worth. Of, we make $300 million in real estate. And 90% of it is right on that Seven Mile Beach. That is our pride and joy. But there's no study specifically to your point. It's limited in scope. But it needs to be more specified. I, I think it is. I think it's all right here in, in Appendix D1. If you read that I read technical, it. technical report that is by Smith, Warner, and Baird, it talks about those. Anyhow, but my point that I want to get to on the EIA is that we're currently in an EIA, what we're calling an EIA scoping update, mm -hmm. where we're looking, you know, that this design has evolved from 2015. There were a lot of concerns that were, uh, we had mentioned the concerns from the EAB on the, on, Due to negative impacts, we're trying to minimize those uh, with this updated design, and there may be further refinements down the road to further minimize those. Uh, but the uh, in addressing those with the permitting process for the EIA and, and eventual coastal works permit is we're developing a um, a EIA scoping update is what we're calling it, which basically outlines all the changes mm -hmm. from previous concept, basically from the, when the EAB and the DOE last left off their review into this is what we have now, and then recommendations for what needs to be uh, evaluated from our end, um, and, then, uh, and then that will be coordinated, and ultimately it will be the DOE that decides uh, you know, what additional studies are needed to satisfy the environmental concerns. Uh, if they decide that we need to do additional studies for Seven Mile Beach and sediment transport, then then we will do that. Excellent. I'm glad that you said that, my friend. Um, we got a couple of callers on the line. Do you all mind taking some calls? Sure. Um, can I just real sure. quick before yes, we sir. jump into that? Um, I, I wanted to say to, to, to Scott's point, one thing we've been continually doing throughout the process is showing the facts, right? There's a, there's a misconception, and there are lots of misconceptions and ideas out on the internet floating around that as soon as the referendum goes one way or the other, if it goes in favor of the peer, that will be in, in, in the, on construction site the next day. Totally not, not a fact. There is an entire process that we've got to go through continuing, mainly studies, maybe, may, mainly follow-up uh, geotech studies that, that need to be done for the process to continue. And I mention that because, you know, we've been coming down here, this is my third time on the show. Yes, sir. Um, you know, every time we come, every time we come down here, we engage individuals to to address some concerns or lack of information we had. I, I went to a, a meeting at a small business a couple weeks ago, and an individual told me that there was no Oasis class ships on order. 
Um, the young gentleman told me he had read it on the internet and it was true. I said, well, I actually work for the company. We have two actually on order and one of them I have seen with my own eyes. So the idea of, of facts versus, versus internet myths are something we're trying to address and that we come here and readdress over and over again. I, I've been here, you know, uh, two previous times. We've had the same caller two times and, you know, I, I understand if people are against the peer, but when people tell us facts that aren't facts or they, they know more about the cruise line or more about Royal Caribbean or more about the company, we're just here to address those concerns. You know, I, I understand from one of the callers we had previously, I think he actually, I think he's called in twice. He said he used to be a customs official and he understands how, how the, how the immigration, cruise, immigration yeah. official, excuse yeah. me. And he understands how the cruise lines work and how this process can be done better and everything like that. I used to work at Papa John's for two years. I don't know anything about a pizza oven, right? So <laughs> we're, we're, we're cruise lines, and we understand that this is all about guest experience for us. The government here has put together the best deal possible. And, and Woody, I know you called me a shark last time. but I, I, wanna, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I, I was a compliment. I, I appreciate You're a great that white eating, eating the minnows that are our government. That's <laughs> plain and simple. Quite the opposite. In this instance, I, I do take that as a compliment. But in this instance... It was a mutual eating of each other. Have you ever seen the picture of the python and the alligator in, the United, in, in Florida where they ate each other and they both died? This is what has happened in this deal. The government was able to negotiate three pieces of the puzzle that normally are not always there. They maintain operations. I can go out tomorrow and get you cash on the barrel today to do this deal if you would give up operations. They kept it. Port Authority of Cayman Islands will not relinquish any operations. Secondly, there's no reduction in, in the revenue of stream over the years. Michael Klein did a study, came out in the Compass just a couple weeks ago. He showed that it basically is going to stay flat if there's no additional growth beyond the 2.5. We know that 2.5 million guests will come here the day the piers are completed. We're confident of that because we control the itineraries. Thirdly, so you can guarantee those numbers? Yes. We will, we, we well, have you to, see, before I've been asking, We won't the guarantee them is... on paper, but we can guarantee them because we've got to finance the debt because we are the signatories, and that's the third piece of the puzzle. The government is not going to have to sign. We can either guarantee the numbers or pay back the debt. Why would we want to pay back the debt when we can just bring the people? We're not, we're, I'm not saying I'm going to guarantee it on a piece of paper. I'm guaranteeing it as a company that doesn't lose money that we're going to pay that debt through the 2.5 million people. Well, we know that you're not going to lose it because your, your tax return is clear to state that, stated that to your, to your shareholders, yeah, to, uh, that you need to secure these, these ports so that you can sell the berths. And the thing with it is, let's just, if, if we're talking, I, I, I like this, but here's, here's the thing. You all are going to make, potentially, even if we just do it a rudimentary math and don't even go to 2.5, you know, Scott is, Scott is like, all right, this is, out of, this is out of my pay grade and other thing. But in terms of that, if you think about this logically, just 2.1, just being an average over what you all put in your, your tax returns, that you make an average of net profit of about $283 per head. If you just do that over the course of the 25 years, you're making close to $4 billion. The point that I was trying to make to, to all of you then, well, if that's the case, why do we need then to pay you? Because it's in your benefit, much more so than ours as well. Why not just give us a little ex extra head tax to that end? And your, your colleague just said, well, he realizes that it is limited somewhat in scope of the sand delivery of, of San Mar Beach. Well, why don't we just put extra head tax on there? which you all can definitely do because Miami, you pay a lot more at Miami for it. In addition to that, just say, well, all right, until we get that scope works, give us a bond, um, put a bond of a half a billion dollars or something in there just in case that Scott does it wrong. And, and, and he lives in his Louisiana cottage <laughs> and, and living a good life while he came out. We have nothing but rocks and so forth in Seven Mile Beach. I'm just saying those are some of the things that I was trying to say to you last time, and I think they're not unreasonable. Um, to that end, because both of us want something, but I prefer when I'm around a negotiating table mm -hmm. to know where I'm at. You need me more than I need you, because there's no doubt that you need the Caribbean. The over 60% of your market worldwide Correct. is in the Caribbean. Correct. And this is a destination that you need. So frankly, I, am at a, I have leverage. You need me more than I need you. I'm not a government but I'm just talking my people. Yep. So if you can give us higher, higher head tax and put a bond on there, then I don't see what anybody will be complaining about because then you can make sure that we're all taken care of somewhere down the line instead of us holding the bag at the end of the day because 
ultimately, there's no free lunches for anybody. You nailed and it. And you know that. You said it correctly. So it's possible to raise the head tax, right? That's something that, that other ports do. But I said there's three pieces of the puzzle. Then the government is going to have to make the guarantees. Then you are the one signing on the loan. So, so it's, it's a give and take. It's, it's a balance. And what I think we have hit a balance that is a scale with three sides to it that is perfectly in balance on the three sides. So you can raise the head tax, but then who's going to take the loan to finance the $200 million you are. plus? So we're going to take a loan and, and increase you don't need the head a loan. Tax. You don't need a loan. You got $200 million in your legal fund that you, you pay for legal fees all uh, Royal Caribbean does not pay $200 uh, million you, you for have, legal you, fees. You have those. What I'm saying, you all have a $1.8 billion. You don't need to finance this in and, any capacity. And we capacity. agreed, and, that, and that's part of the birthing preference, preference project, was that we agreed to loan the money to the winning bidder. And that, that's how we were able to secure the birthing preference. But the winning bidder, it's a call option. And so the winning mm -hmm. bidder decided that, that that's not how they wanted to finance it because we went to market and were able to fund it, fund it in a much cheaper, cheaper methodology. I mean, you understand that there is better interest rates out there that, that, that people can attain, especially on the size of this project. Sure. So by putting in a large equity chunk, you know, greater than the 20, 30 percent that most people would do on their houses in a typical mortgage in the United States, we're able to fund this project in a way that makes it a win-win for everybody involved. And to your other question... Um, related to the bond, we haven't signed anything, right? These discussions are still, we are waiting on the process to go forward. The, we have a, a, a document that has uh, general parameters to it, and there are some open pieces to it that need to be finalized before we go forward. But what we need first is for the people of the Cayman Islands to, to continue absorbing these facts, right? So yeah. we are, you know, people ask me, are you guys... Uh, What's your response to to the judge's ruling yesterday? We're totally fine with it, right? Like we are here and letting every single piece of legislature process happen, voting the people's rights to vote. Judicial has now gotten involved. When the people make the decision and the people have all the facts, then we'll go forward just as as they want. And if not, we've said it a million times. We'll continue to bring our ships, but we will not have the ability to bring our bigger ships. And over time, that will result in a decline in the number of cruise passengers that, that come to, to the Cayman Islands. And one, from one other you, quick... From you or from the cruise lines? I, I believe definitely from Royal, but if you look at the, the ships that are on order, you've probably heard the number 115 mm -hmm. ships on order. That's basically confirmed orders. 50% of those ships are less than 1,000 passengers, mm -hmm. the small guys. And, I, and, I, and I'm close on these numbers, I'm just assuming. The other 50% are 4,000 plus, Right. And even bigger than that, 5,000 plus, right now there are nine ships in the industry that are 5,000 plus. In 10 years, Woody, there's going to be 27 ships that are 5,000 plus. And those are ships that are on order, that are coming down the line. And that's only what we know about, right? So Royal Caribbean, when an order happens, we have basically four different processes. One is the 10, 15-year model down the road. My guys in the design team are looking at the project of what they're going to put out. Secondly, we go and we have a handshake deal with the, with the shipbuilder. Hey, next year, we're going to start because they're in six-year order modes to put it in. Second is we have a signed deal. And third, excuse me, and fourth, the process is underway. So we only know what is actually out there in those two last areas. The other three and four, we only know them as companies. And what we're seeing is that the window for these big ships is just growing and growing and growing. And it's one thing that, that Cayman Islands will continue to miss out. You are the largest port in the world by numbers that still tenders. Belize only has... Isn't that unique? But, but, but I, it's, I not, it's not unique. It, it's like saying that driving an old beaten up car is unique, right? It, it, you can get a new car. Listen, my 6 or 7 Corvette is absolutely sweet. It's better because than any brand new one. you probably take care of it. it. <laughs> you probably take care of it. And, there, and there's some... There's some rest, my, rest my Corvette. But it's like saying, is a, is a dirt road unique? Yeah. Right? No, it's not good for your 67 Corvette. Yeah. Eventually, you're going to say, hey, can you get me some asphalt? Or can you pour me some concrete on this? Because I want to make it go faster. But TJ, I don't want it to be bouncing. Where, where are some of these larger ships going? It's not in the German market, and uh, according to your tax returns, and the Asian market, we, um, I remember the description. I thought it was really good that um, you, know, you all put in there for your shareholders that the new German ship that's going to the German market, the large one, is going to be outfitted with very German-esque feel so they can feel really back at home. And yep. then the other ones are going to the Chinese market, very outfitted with 
a lot of Asian, a lot of Chinese influence. Yeah. So where where are most of those going? Not to the Asian market and to the European market? No, no. And and normally the European market, the larger ships will shift. So as the as the seasons change, so currently we have three year round Oasis class in the market, in the Caribbean market, and then one that's in the Caribbean. Next year when the fifth Oasis class comes online, it will start off in Asia. So we'll have five uh, Oasis class and three in the Caribbean and one that bounces back from the Mediterranean and such. So, and then we have another one in a couple years after that. So they're always going to stay in the Caribbean. Like you said earlier, mm -hmm. 60% of our market is the Caribbean. That's right. So our biggest money makers and our best ships yeah. are these big guys. We need to keep bringing You, you said that about freedom class as well. But, and now we've gotten better. We have a better ship. I, 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 here's the thing that I, I have. And, and it goes back to that question I had from an individual who told me that there's no such thing as the next Oasis class, right? The next Oasis class ship. He, he was dead set in his mind that it didn't exist. And I said, I, I don't understand where you're getting this from. He said, I read it on the Internet. It's true. No matter how many times people say, you know, freedom class is great. You're going to have Asia ship. We know what our customers want. And we love the Cayman Islands, and we love our Oasis class guests. We want to bring him here. We want to bring them all here. People say you can tender an Oasis. And, oh, here's a I got you document from 2012 where we looked into the ability to tender a lure. You've mentioned it a million times. We are a very strong business that looks at everything from seven ways to Sunday. So we looked at it <clears throat> in 2012. How many ships Oasis class have we tendered since 2012? Zero, because theoretically it was possible, but practically we couldn't accomplish it. There was no money left on the table for the Cayman Islands. There was no conspiracy theory that we're holding it out. All these things are rubbish. <laughs> I, I, I can't express to people enough that if you want the facts, we're here to answer questions and make decisions based on the facts. If you're against the peer, that's totally fine. I got no, I got, I got no dog in that fight. But if you want to make your decision based on facts and information that we as cruise lines, who know our guests better than anybody, that we can provide to you, that's what we're here to do. We have showed up at small business meetings. I've showed up at your show every single time you've asked me because mm -hmm. I've got nothing to hide. I'm not, I'm not trying to pull a shell game or a fast end. Everything a part of this deal is wide open. And we understand that there are environmental concerns. And we understand that there's things that, 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 that are going to need to be addressed following the referendum. But from a business case, from a guest experience case, from a better deal case for the government, none of those are facts that people can, can change reality. The reality is what it is. And, and one of the things I greatly appreciate, and I commend you, Woody, is that you're able to have these conversations, right? You are a, I, I hate talking politics with certain people because they get so emotional. But when you can have a, a fluid discussion and, and, a, and a discussion of understanding between parties, Look, you make great points that I don't know about, I don't understand, I defer to my team on. And I respect you for it, and you do your research. But we have a discussion. Mm. There's so much information where I've gotten yelled at by people with just misinformation. Mm. They're yelling at me things that are not true. And so we're just here. We're going to continue to be here. As, much, as many times as you invite me, I will come here and answer questions, and I greatly appreciate it. And you know, one thing I'm excited about, we've got to go and take a break and pay some bills, right? Okay. But here's one thing I'm excited about, TJ, okay. is that it's not off the table yet that you would not be considering, wouldn't consider a bond to make sure that we're all secure, to make score. Scotty, you know, the, if he messes up <laughs> in his engineering, and then in addition to more head tax of all of us as well, and, and you can afford it, $4 billion over the over the term. Just give me you, a we number. We can do it. We can do it. We can, wait, well, I, uh, I'll, give you, I'll drop a number on this, believe me. Uh. Uh, well, we'll be right back after this. We've got tons of, of messages and comments that's coming in. We've okay. got callers on the line. We would like to get them as well. If you all want to participate, 233-1019 is the in-studio number. 233-1019. WhatsApp is 324-1019. You can leave a written text on that and also a voice note on the WhatsApp. That is 324-1019. Crosstalk will be back to leading Gay Man's Conversation shortly on Rooster 101.